This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you episode 24 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading The Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, June 13th, 1908. I will add commentary to elaborate on what was happening in Westford 113 years ago. Uh, The first section in the June 13th issue is the About Town section. The ball game last Saturday between Groton and Westford resulted in a victory for the Grottons by a score of 6-5. The failure of Joe Butler, the pitcher for the Westford team, to be present was largely responsible for the defeat. At least, local pride likes to look at it that way, and the closeness of the game seems to warrant it as the correct way of looking at it. This afternoon, the Westford team goes to Nashua to play the Nashua Card Shop team at Lawndale Park. At a meeting of the building committee for enlarging Ford's Village Schoolhouse held on last Wednesday, the contract was awarded to P. Henry Harrington of Graniteville for $5,479. Harry Whitney, age 14, is supporting a broken arm as the result of falling off a bicycle last Saturday night on Providence Road. William E. Wright is first in town to pick strawberries last week Friday. It is difficult to beat at the right way of succeeding. S.L. Taylor is the first to register having peas for dinner Saturday, June 13th. They were planted when some farmers thought it was a favorable time to shed, sled up wood. The, that What he's referring to is uh, when there was snow on the ground and what farmers usually did in the winter was cut down trees and sled them back to the barn or the house to be cut up for uh, firewood. Reverend C.P. Marshall had potatoes in blossom June 1st, planted in the leisure wintertime. Reverend William Brown of Tingsboro conducted the services at the Unitarian Church last Sunday as a supply for William, uh, for Reverend B. H. Bailey. He preached a wise sermon on, quote, the law of heredity, end quote. Mrs. Bryant, the organist of the church, has gone to Chicago for the summer season, and her place is supplied by Mrs. Puffer of Lowell. Mr. Bailey, by permission of medical authority, expects to conduct services at this church on Sunday, January 14th, or June 14th. That's the following day. Emory J. Whitney, who bought the Proctor Place on Main Street, is preparing for improvements on the buildings. Fletcher and Needham of Littleton will do the work. C.P.R. Decatur has gone to New York with the Phalanx Military Company of Lowell, of which he is a member. He lived on the, uh, in the Pelotia Fletcher House on Lowell Road. The next section is called Conference. Although the dust was the only element that clouded the sun and the heat as intense as any in a country familiarly frequently alluded to, I think he's referring to hell here, yet braving these adverse extremes, 22 from town attended the Unitarian Conference and ordination at Littleton Wednesday. Among those who attended were Emily F. Fletcher, Delia Wheeler, Clara Smith, Edith Foster, Mrs. J. M. Fletcher, Mrs. H. B. Reed, Mrs. A. H. Sutherland, Ella Hildreth, Carrie Woods, Mrs. C. W. Anderson, Eva Fletcher, Ruth Fisher, Mrs. John Feeney, Mary Mohan, Dorothy Sleeper, Caroline Hewitt, Mrs. John Burbeck, Grace Burbeck, Mrs. George Drew, Mr. and Mrs. S. L. Taylor. The conference passed resolutions of sympathy for Reverend B. H. Bailey, who was assigned a part of the, in the ordination service, but on account of the effects of his recent illness, was unable to be present. The next conference will be held at Nashua in October. The next section is the Westford Center section. Mrs. Oscar R. Spaulding entertained the members of the Thimble Club for an all-day outing at her camp at Forge Pond Tuesday. This has come to be an annual event, and Tuesday's beautiful June day, the charm of Mrs. Spaulding's hospitality, and the congenial companionship made this gathering a red-letter day in the annals of the club. 
Those members much missed were Mrs. G.W. Good, who is spending the summer abroad, Miss Ruth Fisher, away spending the day visiting schools, and Mrs. A.W. Hartford, detained at home with illness. She's the one that was recovering from a home appendectomy. Harry L. Nesmith, tree warden, with his men, have bound all the trunks of the shade trees in the village with strips of burlap and are examining the same at regular intervals and destroying the brown tail moths that collect. This is uh, similar to the problem we had a number of years ago with years ago with gypsy moths in town, where we would put sticky tape on the trunks of the trees, and the caterpillars would stick to it as they climbed up into the trees to uh, spin their cocoons. Reverend and Mrs. William E. Anderson are enjoying their first sojourn north since their marriage a year ago in April. They arrived at Mr. and Mrs. C.H. Wright's last week Wednesday and are much enjoying meeting meeting their many friends. Reverend Anderson served as pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church at Graniteville, as it was called at the time, from 1905 to 1907, while he was attending Boston University School of Theology. He, he married uh, Clara Bell Wright, daughter of Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Charles H. Wright, referred to above, of, of Westford, in April 1907. Right after their wedding, the young couple took a train to Middlebourne, West Virginia, where Rever- Reverend Anderson served as pastor. They would return to Westford in 1919 when Reverend Anderson returned to serve the Methodist Church in Graniteville again, serving until 1924. He is the only Methodist minister of that church to marry a Westford girl and the only Methodist pastor of that church to be buried in Westford. I might add that uh, uh, some of you know Arnold Wilder, who lived uh, to be almost 100 years old and was quite a Westford historian, he mentioned to me one day that he remembered uh, Reverend Anderson quite well, that he was a large, uh, very jovial man, and uh, he would, used to come into uh, the Wright and Fletcher store periodically, and uh, um, Arnold always enjoyed talking to him. The Fisher Camp, the Birches, and the Sleeper Camp, the Treetops, were open over Memorial Day and Sunday. Mr. and Mrs. Buckshorn have rented their camp for the season. The J.C. Abbott camp is reported for sale. Uh, these are these camps or cottages were located on Forge Pond, and uh, this time of the of the year around Memorial Day was when people uh, came back to their cottages and opened them up for the summer season. Miss Sarah D. Hamlin of San Francisco is visiting her native town, a guest at Mrs. Lizzie Hamlin's. I'll say more about Sarah Hamlin next week. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur E. Day are receiving congratulations on the birth of a son, Norman E. Day, who was born Wednesday, June 3rd. Many Westford friends will be interested to know that Dr. Nettie M. Stevens of Bryn Mawr College sailed May 30th for a year's travel and study abroad. Dr. Nettie M. Stevens was an 1880 graduate of Westford Academy and and was an early geneticist best known for the discovery of the X and Y sex chromosomes. She would die in 1912 at the young age of 50. A set of views of Norway from Christiana to North Cape are on exhibition at the library. The next section is called Bank Account Claimed. Uh, And it's a little... um, complex, I would say. Among the lost bank accounts recently advertised in a Lowell paper by the Five Cent Savings Bank was one of George H. Kappen. L.W. Wheeler showed this to his mother, Mrs. M.J. Wheeler of Westford, who saw a possible chance of getting trace of a, and getting a trace of a long, unheard of unheard from cousin. Several addresses of mutual friends were furnished the bank officials to no purpose. Mrs. Wheeler wrote to Kappen's mother, Mrs. Susan Clow of West Concord, New Hampshire. She had been left a widow with two little children and at the earnest desire of a sister without children had allowed George Hall 
to become George Cappen, the adopted son of Albert, Albert Cappen, a former resident of Lowell, who left there a good position with the Boston and Lowell Railroad to, insu- to superintend the construction of the Panama Railroad. This letter was returned as unknown and uncalled for. Then a letter was sent to the West Concord postmaster inquiring about Mrs. Clow. This was handed to Henry Chase of that place, who wrote that his mother had married a third time and had died in 1892. When he was informed what was wanted, he wrote to his half-brother, Cappen, who then communicated with the bank people. Mr. Cappen then wrote to his cousin, stating that it was many years since he had heard from any of his own people and that he had entirely forgotten this bank deposit. He had been in various places in the West in the meantime, being now in Detroit, Michigan. Various stories of lost bank accounts have been published in Lowell papers. The turning point in this hunt was in the postmaster, whose memory and astuteness was better than many. The next section is the Forge Village section. Mrs. George Byron Leahy died at Stanford PQ, which is the abbreviation for province of Quebec. Thursday, June 4th, age 23 years. She resided here for a number of years, going to Stanford after she married. She leaves to mourn her loss, her husband and three small children, the youngest three months old. Also four sisters, Hannah of Marlborough, Rose, Delphine, and Louise of this village, and four brothers, Henry of Milford, New Hampshire, Wilfred of Wakefield, Frank and Oliver of this village. Word come, came to G.H. Prescott Tuesday of the death of Mrs. Etta Shaw at her daughter's in Lynn. Mrs. Shaw came to care for her sister, the late Mrs. Prescott, and after her death remained to keep house for Mr. Prescott. She was not feeling well, so went to her daughter's to visit for a few weeks, where she died of liver trouble. Her husband and son are in British Columbia. Joseph uh, F. McCarthy son of Enos, per the 1908 town report, while at work in the card room of the Abbott Company's mills Tuesday, met with a fatal accident. He got his arm caught between a belt and a pulley, causing him to strike his head against a gear, which rendered him unconscious. Dr. Godfrey of of Littleton and Dr. Sleeper of Westford were called and found him suffering from a fractured skull. He was taken to the Lowell Hospital, where he died Thursday after Thursday forenoon. He was 31 years of age and leaves a wife, uh, Josephine uh, Nay Brisson, and three children, the oldest five years and the youngest three months old. Funeral at St. Catherine's Church, Sunday morning. The many friends of Margaret O'Hara will be pleased to know that she is now assistant district nurse at Concord, New Hampshire. She was a resident of this village for many years. Miss Grace Litchfield and Miss Raines entertained a number of the Chelmsford teachers over Sunday at Mr. Good's cottage on Forge Pond. Mrs. Good is in Europe, and Mr. Good expects to join her soon. Anniversaries. Mrs. Lucretia Reed celebrated the anniversary of her birth at her home in this village on Monday. She is 81 years old. It was also the wedding anniversary of her granddaughter, Mrs. Harry Ingalls, who was Miss Zena Mitchell before her marriage eight years ago. Mrs. Reed is remarkably active for one of her years and presided at the dinner as easily as in her younger days. Twenty persons were present. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending June 13th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions from the Wardsman at the Westford Historical Society's website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.